Uh, it is an absolute pri privilege for the um, Footsteps Festival book plug to be welcoming Tim Atkinson to um, the book plug for his session on Where Does It Hurt? Um, his memoir on having persistent pain and learning to deal with it. Um, and uh, it has, I'm just so grateful that um, Tim was um, encouraged to, to come along and get in touch with the festival once he'd released his book, um, because I'm, it's been such a lovely read for me. Um, and I'm really excited to hear more um, from Tim and hopefully a few of you will uh, get to hear a wee bit more about the book. Um, so Tim, uh, you're very welcome. Um, if you'd just like to start off uh, telling us a bit about you and your journey up to this point for those of those people who haven't um, read the book yet. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, lovely to be able to talk about uh, talk about my latest book, which is like nothing else that I've um, that I've written in what has um, been a kind of accidental 10 year writing career. Um, I perhaps ought to explain at first that I uh, I haven't always been a writer. I was a school teacher for 20 years and um, about 10, 12 years ago, gave that up full time. I have done some part time work since in different schools, but gave it up full time, partly because of the um, of the strain of the psoriatic arthritic, the inflammatory arthritis condition that I'd um, been diagnosed with about 10 years, 10 years prior to that. I know everybody always thinks teachers get far too many holidays and six weeks in the summer and all this kind of thing. But um, without going into any kind of boring detail, there's an awful lot to it and it can be terrifically physical, physically demanding. So what I decided I would do when my um, son was born was I'd give up work and I'd stay at home and I'd do the easy job of looking after him. Well, of course, you're laughing because you all know that that was anything but, I, but it was terrific fun. It was one of the best decisions that I've ever made. I've had a terrific time since then. As I say, once the kids grew up a bit and started school themselves, I've been able to go back on a part time basis. But I've also, through starting a blog about being a stay at home dad, got into a whole world of writing, which has taken me on a on a journey through fiction, a couple of novels, through school textbooks, which was the first thing I did as an ex teacher to try and get a foot in the door of publication, um, right through to the latest book, which is, um, which has been a, a labour of love, and um, a great pleasure, even though, of course, it's about, um, it's about pain. It actually, um, the story of it actually starts a couple of years um, before I started even thinking about it, when I was um, researching my second novel, which was about the First World War. I've always been fascinated with the with the war, with the Great War in particular, and um, I've always known that one day I would write a book about it. And uh, I've always also known that there are too many really, really good books about the Great War. I wasn't ever going to compete with any of those. So I knew that my take was going to be different. And it was. It was about um, the end of the war and the battlefield clearances and the establishment of the great Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries. Um, so I dragged the kids round France and Flanders and we went to so many commemorations they bought me a little badge with which looks like a prefix badge with war bore written across it but the book came out and it was a discussion that I did uh, with somebody about that which really just um, uh, emphasized the fact that there was a link between the pain that I was suffering now and the approach that I was beginning to develop to it and the lives and particularly the response to to their traumatic war injuries of some of the men whose whose um, 
war work I'd written about. I mean, to put it in, it, in its simplest form, um, people get injured in war, often quite uh, traumatically, very seriously, and at the same time can apparently feel no pain. And at other times, the same people can be rolling around on the floor in agony as a result of uh, uh, of getting a, an inoculation, getting a, a vaccination. Um, I knew from those few examples that I'd come across that there was something very interesting about pain. And so as that particular book sort of got put to one side and uh, went off to be published, I started delving into the history of, of, of medicine in warfare in particular. And I came across the work of um, the Second World War American medic, Henry Beecher, who probably more than anyone else is responsible for what we now understand about the placebo effect. The idea that we within ourselves can have some capacity to completely turn off or at the very least turn down our own sensations of pain. Beecher, I started to read, uh, had had the same kind of experiences firsthand in treating uh, US soldiers during World War II. Um, and he, as a medic, had gone on after the war to research them, to study them in detail, and to develop, um, as I say, this 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 um, current, um, uh, currently well uh, uh, respected theory about them. Um, so that was one aspect of the book and how it came about. It began to mesh, of course, with my own personal experience. I was um, I was reading some very big books, uh, big heavy tomes like this, with um, uh, very sore fingers, very arthritic hands, but finding that unusually I could sit for two or three hours and hold the books and because I was so engrossed in the content and because I was busy making notes about what I was reading, I forgot about the pain. It um, had a, an unhappy knack of returning the moment I put the books down the moment, I don't know, the kids came through the door, the moment I started doing all the normal things that I do and everything sort of came to the forefront. But there was something there that was um, interesting and that I found um, worth uh, worth considering. And the third um, reason why uh, I decided I'd uh, write a book about my own chronic pain is probably the most ironic of of all and that is that I've never ever enjoyed talking about it before and I've never uh, been the kind of person who's discussed his um, ailments or medical treatment. Um, I'm not putting that out as, as a virtue, it's if anything a vice because it means that other people and especially some of the people closest to me um, don't always have a full understanding of the kind of things that uh, that I've been suffering, and that's my fault. Uh, but I thought it was about time that changed. It's a kind of man thing, I suppose, in a way. It's a kind of uh, not untypical masculine response to hide things away, to sweep uh, things under the carpet, and to try and pretend that they're not there. But over the course of 20 years of um, increasingly severe uh, psoriatic arthritis, it's been impossible to hide, you know, um, it's been impossible to keep on pretending. And it's been obvious that I've really had to face up to the fact that this is now um, a significant part of my life and needs some um, needs owning up to. Um, there's only so far you can go when you're pretending that your wife's carrying the shopping because you've got a bad back or pretending that you're walking with a stick because you've injured your foot or something like that. Um, and so the third factor was, I thought it was time I became, you know, I, I came clean with with my own condition and um, and put it out there. And of course, being what I've now become accidentally over the last 10 years, a writer, I uh, I did what writers do and I started writing it down 
and I started writing down the kind of things that I was reading and I started sort of filtering that through my own experience and trying to express it in a way that um, I th I hoped was going to be both um, entertaining and uh, and informative with a view hopefully to try and connect with people in a similar position because um, as somebody was saying earlier in the pre uh, session discussion it's very easy for the vast numbers of pain patients um, 1.2 billion people worldwide with with chronic pain pain that's defined as having lasted for longer than three months it's far too easy for them just to keep on taking the tablets um, that's what I did for uh, a long time um, and it's um, it's a it's a nice solution while they work uh, but of course it's pretty obvious that after a while they lose some of their effectiveness the if the the edge gets taken off because of um, things like physical tolerance and uh, the side effects start taking an effect which is um, which is less than desirable and it's at that point that you begin to row back and think there's got to be more there's got to be something else I can do and so connecting the wires together that something else became writing this book and if at the very least it was um, uh, it did nothing more than than prove uh, really successful distraction therapy then it certainly did that just as I was distracted from the pain in my arthritic hands when I was reading books that I was engrossed in when I was writing this book and finding out all the totally bonkers but hugely fascinating facts about pain the pain subsided and I realized that uh, at the end of the day uh, if you can do something whatever that is or however small you can uh, you can just start to take back some of the control that you feel that you're losing when um, when you're a chronic pain patient. So that kind of um, covers the the whys and the wherefores, I suppose. Yeah. Um, no, I um, I thank you so much for sharing that, Tim. Like it, um, I suppose just around that last point there. Um, I suppose the the lack of control that you felt at the beginning when you were taking the medication but still struggling i i i just wanted to let you know how beautifully that was communicated you know through your chapters mm. um i could i could really relate to that 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 um those stories of people struggling to to manage or you know manage their condition they feel like they're being treated for it but they but they're not managing it yeah yeah well i mean we all know that the traditional sort of medical approach to to pain however it's caused is 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 very mechanistic there's something wrong and it has to be treated and that that is the road that i've been down and i can't um, I can't gainsay the kind of treatment that I've had or the or the consultations that I've I've received, because um, generally the diagnosis has worked and so has the treatment and 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 that was in a way a double bind because I got to a stage about twelve years after initial diagnosis where we'd we'd hit on a treatment at last, which was setting the arthritis into remission it stabilized and then actually improved and my mobility improved and of course yeah as everybody knows once you can move you know we're beginning to move into a a, a territory where all sorts of possibilities can uh, can become apparent um but the pain was still there the pain persisted the pain was as bad as it ever was and there was no explanation and so the medical approach was simply to keep dialing up the strength of the of the I was on opioids at the time and dialing up their strength um, so that it got to a situation where they were they were great at, um, at controlling the pain uh, but they were leaving me in a in a situation where I could um, I felt I couldn't function you know I had to um, I had to uh, the, the times that I'm in a classroom in a school I've got you've got to be reasonably sharp you know you've got to be prepared it's a secondary school you know you've got to be alert to everything that's going on in a classroom with 30 kids um 
with my own children in in a family situation as well you know you you can't be you can't be sort of laid out on the sofa sort of um half asleep when they're at, at, as the, as they were at the time sort of toddlers and, and youngsters um and so it was it was it was clearly something that i was going to have to try and do something about it's taken a long long time and it's almost been an accidental discovery but it's probably been yeah, the most important discovery of my life it really has incidentally on the accidental part of the discovery just to link the two things together um richard pell who some of you may know from the uh connect health's flipping pain uh, campaign i don't know whether he, don't, he he may not forgive me for saying this but richard pell is a former student of mine he was at um he was at boston grammar school in lincolnshire when i taught there and uh he was there so i've known him from a little sort of 11 year old well actually he was never that little richard pell for those who don't know him is about six foot seven and uh you know, there aren't many people i'm six foot three there aren't many people who kind of look down on me and he was looking down on me from about the time he was in year 10 so from about the age of about 15. um he was um he was uh suffering from knee problems um at about the same time as my knee started so you know when he was in the sixth form we compared notes <laughs> about our respective arthroscopies and things like that but then he left school went to university trained as a physiotherapist and uh, got back in touch with me a few years ago because i posted something online about chronic pain and it was at the time when i was i was doing so as nothing more than a person with lived lived experience and i was shooting from the hip about the kind of uh, despair that i was in at having seemingly no option other than to keep taking the tablets and he happened to be down in Lincolnshire pre-pandemic when people could come travel freely from one area of the country to another visit relatives because of course his family is still here and he said um, come and meet me for a coffee so we did and he it was he that introduced me to the 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 pain science aspect of it to Lorimer Mosley the Australian pain scientist who's uh, been so responsible for, uh, for, for, for developing these kind of uh, these this this knowledge um, over the past 20 years or so and he told me at the time that he was beginning to um, think about getting together this this pain campaign it wasn't called flipping pain at the time it went through various incarnations he had a um, a kind of dry run launch event in Boston which I attended and uh, so it's um, largely through him that I come to be in the situation that I am in now, because of course, as a result of that interest being sparked and as a result of me being um, asked on board that sort of professional pain bandwagon, um, I've, man I've managed to uh, feed an awful lot of that kind of stuff into the book and uh, meet an awful lot of fantastically inspirational people along the way. So it's been uh, it's been quite a journey, which has got sort of links going off in, in all sorts of different directions. It's it's and, and actually that's a wonderful point, Tim, because that's what really, um, really came out to me about your book is it's incredibly human. And that's that's what I, I really love about the way the science is communicated as well as it's through your own experience and. I really connected to this book in a way that I don't necessarily connect to other, um, you know, obviously I, I, I read pain books and things like that because I'm interested. Um, but I, I really appreciated the stories around your, your narrative. And even just when you're speaking there, the, the anecdotes and the, the stories within stories, that's just what I get from your book as well is um is is just that sense of is that's that sense of humanity and that sense of connectedness and i love that you credit everyone else for this these ideas but your mm. your your book is also incredibly meticulously researched <laughs> well I'm, I'm delighted to hear you say that because uh it's 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 a big order when you're not a a, a scientist to try and um to try and make sure all these uh, these scientific uh, theories are, are accurately represented i mean i did come 
from a, a philosophical background, I had um, I did go to university to study philosophy many, many years ago. And I've since taught philosophy and psychology. So I did have a little bit of a brain based um, understanding, certainly as far as um, as as normal perceptual uh, perceptual awareness is, is concerned. Um, but at, at, at the time, of course, um, there was there was no suggestion that this kind of this kind of understanding would or could relate to uh, relate to pain you know the science just hadn't caught up with that kind of uh, those kind of philosophical speculations and they oh they, that's that's kind of what they were they were no more than than philosophical ideas but i did find that they linked in very very uh, very very neatly with some of the very very latest neuroscience i mean the just 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 simple ideas that um the pain which we all regard simplistically as an alarm as a mechanistic response from damage somewhere in our bodies is is just far more than that it's a two-way process between body and brain it's a it's a conversation and just like any normal conversation that any two people might have there can be misunderstandings and the signals can get distorted and the sound can be lost and we can mishear some of the signals and realizing that that's exactly what the brain does you know it was a bit of a light bulb moment because of course i knew that was what the brain does with regard to visual perception you know one of the studies that i'd done at university was 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 on visual perception and uh, it's still a very very uh little understood area of of of, um, of neuroscience um but the basic theory that we are um creating a matrix like model of the outside world i mean it, it doesn't mean that the page in front of you doesn't exist it doesn't mean that the laptop isn't there and that we're not all in our respective rooms you know it's not that um uh, dramatic but you know, on, a, on a very simplistic level, you know, the fact that you've got color vision for, for, throughout the range of your, your your eyesight is is a is a is a function of of what your brain is doing because you've only got color receptors going in this direction, and yet you can see color, you know, all around you. Because but the our, brain, the eyes are only receiving eyes. black and white signals from here. Some of the certain aspects of the three dimensional. Um, uh, experience that we have in the world is is again you know um creations of the brain and there, it's all evolutionary evolutionary very successful because it's what we need in order to be the people that we are and and, and make the most of the world that we're in so there's no question that we are just you know, you know sort of brains in a in a in a in a lab somewhere being you know, tickled by electrodes to, to <laughs> or we're just not in bed dreaming all the time. It's never it's never as dramatic as that. But aspects of that feed very nicely into some of the harder uh, to understand elements of chronic pain. Because once you do get over the um, understanding that you might be in pain, but there might not be anything wrong, mm -hmm. therefore you might actually have more control over what you feel than than you would normally expect. Once you get over that kind of um, uh, barrier almost anything is possible i mean yeah. it literally is i mean there are there are people who didn't make it into the book um but i was very tempted to include and i just got to the stage talking about it with an editor where some things just had to go but there were the i, I did touch on some of the religious and spiritual aspects of um of, of pain through the centuries especially in christianity uh, which which is traditionally um uh traditionally valued the mortification of the flesh you know that uh, has, has relegated the physical experience over the spiritual um which has led to um a strain of, of of christian asceticism which has been very bodily denying to the extent that that suffering can be welcomed and embraced and if you're embracing suffering and if you're welcoming it it doesn't become suffering anymore it becomes a sort of ecstasy you know there, there are countless st Teresa of avila is a good example um, throughout history of people and there were some eastern mystical um religious examples that i was going to include as well people who go through especially in um, in hindu certain hindu traditions go through very extreme 
um, acts of bodily uh, mutilation, really. I, I don't think there's a, another word for it. I don't want that to be charged sort of negatively, but, but they do. Yeah. And they overcome their, phys their obvious physical injuries through an immense power of will, which is fed from their own spiritual spiritual beliefs and and their and their rock solid faith in what they're doing and and the purpose of what they're doing but again it just shows that there's an awful lot more going on to to it goes back to the war examples and henry beecher you know if you can have your leg blown off on a battlefield and not feel it and uh, furthermore if you can as many amputees do up to 80 percent of amputees feel uh, physical sensations in limbs that are no longer there then you know there's something there's something pretty spooky going on something else going on yeah yeah, yeah. No, absolutely and uh, yeah it's i suppose it's that meaning that you um that you communicate so well through your book is um is that is that kind of meaning and purpose of pain and and why that two-way conversation can sometimes go awry and you communicate that from your lived experience um so as a result i think i think you you are able to give concrete examples um and i think that's where i think that's where a lot of people really struggle to un you know really take on these really challenging messages because they feel as if people clinicians usually are telling them that their pain isn't real yeah and that's where and that's where your book is really i think helpful and um especially for some of the men in my life who also have psoriasis um and and achy joints that um your book is incredibly accessible from that from that perspective and i i, I just think it's it's a really valuable a really valuable perspective to have out there tim Thank you. That's that's great. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Of course, it is the meaning that we attach to the pain, which which makes a big difference. I mean, you know, the meaning that I was attaching when I was getting up off the sofa and going ow and ouch and 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 ooh and when my fingers were hurting, holding a book that I wasn't particularly enjoying. You know, uh, and a fear as well is another factor because if you're in that situation and you are feeling pain and the pain is real, regardless, um, it's likely to cause. Um, uh, an emotional response, a negative emotional response, and of course that just makes the pain worse. Um, uh, I got very uh, frustrated with myself. I went through a phase of being hugely self-critical and um, and uh, almost hating parts of my own body, which sounds ridiculous, I know, but you know, oh, you know, hands just... I had a stage where I couldn't where I was serious, I found it seriously difficult holding mugs, you know, which is quite uh, a problem when you've got hot tea and, and, and things in them. So I was having to be really careful. And I was a at the stage where I was in denial, and I didn't want other people to know. So I would have to collude with my wife about um, trying to hide this right when you know, when, when people were coming around, right, we're gonna have tea, you'll you'll have to put it there. And it'll have to have a saucer and uh i don't know we'll make some joke about you lifting it up for me you know and it was ridiculous utterly ridiculous but it was part of the process that i was going through at the time you know i just couldn't i couldn't credit the fact that at 35 or whatever i was uh, then i was i was behaving in a way that that had me had me acting like an like an but an elderly man i was um i was suffering you know so many pains in so many joints and having so many problems with 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 um with some of my uh, some of my muscles that um it was it was difficult to um to function uh, on a day to day basis normally and so i would i would i would try to deny it i would try to hide it but of course you the last person you can hide that from is yourself so my response personally on a personal level was was at one stage huge frustration and anger and i don't think that's unusual and i certainly don't think it's uh unsurprising mm -hmm. but it is hugely uh 
problematic because of course that's another one of the meanings that we're attaching to the pain that we're in that actually makes the pain worse you know if i'd known at the time that these things were all gonna notch that pain level up by a few degrees every time every time i you know tried to clench my fist and it hurt and I you know, grip my teeth then you know the cortisol levels are rising the stress response is kicking in and the pain you know those pain signals are getting um fast tracked and and the um <laughs> the the channels on which they're traveling are going to be um are going to become very well worn and going to make it an awful lot easier next time there's even the slightest twinge or the slightest brush, you know, against your against your your knee, and it's going to send a a, a hugely over um, overreacted uh, pain message up to the brain. It's um it's very difficult. Yeah, you're describing. Um, sorry, you're, you're describing you're describing uh, you're describing um how you bullied yourself beautifully there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. You just have to, we you know we just have to look like everything's fine and mm. um you know i just i just need to buck up in order to be stronger to you know to get through this and all the while all the while you were pushing through and 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 not looking at the other i suppose options that he had available yeah, to you as well yeah, yeah it is it's 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 difficult but i think that's all part of the the kind of catharsis the process that that i've gone through which i think has been helped enormously by by writing the book yeah it's taken a long time and i hope you know perhaps in some cases in a few cases through perhaps reading the book it won't take other people quite as long and i and i know for a fact it won't because of all the uh, work that's being done by things like footsteps festival by flipping pain and by but, but by the people like um those who suffer from chronic pain who are now getting themselves out there as uh, as uh, as pain warriors high functioning pain warriors i mean that's what that's what they all are I mean, the people who run this festival are just uh, terrifically inspirational because of the work they do and the experience that they've that they've got. And, you know, it's taken me 10 years in a book to do what, you know, should have been an awful lot easier and actually would have been an awful lot easier were I starting that process now because of all the resources and the hugely inspirational individuals that there are it's it's amazing it really is and i'm absolutely full of admiration for every one of them it's great stuff shall i read shall i read a chapter i've been I i've been doing that. the audio book there is there is part of the reason i'm croaky is because the kids have come back excuse me i'm i'm the lap the, the my laptop is on my lap which is why i keep moving a little bit um the um kids have come back with colds from school and we've all got croaky and I was in the middle of going in and just at a little local studio doing the audio recordings I got up to about chapter six last week when um I couldn't read any more but I think I've got a tiny bit more voice left so I I I think I, I think I think um the croak adds to the performance <laughs> and we would love to hear a chapter I'm very excited about the audiobook as well I, I it's it's fabulous that so many books are available in multiple yeah. accessible options these days Absolutely. so oh, definitely, um, definitely. We, i yeah. really i really admire you doing it yourself as well because apparently it's a whole other set of skills reading out your own work <laughs> it is yeah and i'll tell you what the worst of it is having gone through um several quite um uh forensic proofreads the still <laughs> The odd mistake that I only see when I'm reading it back to my that cannot yeah. possibly have gone to the printers like that. I I'll have, read them. I have read no them. doubt. But, yeah, uh, that is. Um, yeah, we'd we'd love to hear a chapter. I'll read chapter ten because um, it concentrates on the way what I have and uh, what I've got has affected the way I look, you know, a man's face, as Oscar Wilde said, is his autobiography. And uh, yeah, you can't really hide much when uh, when you're in pain, because your face is um, is a dead giveaway. So chapter 10. 
A few years ago, an unassuming electrical engineer from Budapest became an internet sensation. A worldwide meme. Hide the pain, Harold. Andras Sharato is an ordinary man. He was shocked when his image went viral and his wife was annoyed by the attention. The photo itself began life innocently enough when Arato was contacted by a professional photographer who wanted to shoot some stock images for an agency. He did the shoot, thought nothing more about it. But then people latched on to one particular image, a photo of a man with white hair and a neat beard, smiling, but smiling in a way that looked somehow forced, as if he was smiling through some pain. People began adding captions. My wife just left me. My identity was stolen. I won the lottery but lost the ticket. Arato was even recruited to shoot a commercial for an Hungarian gar car dealership. As the vehicle he just bought broke down, a uh, should have gone to Specsavers caption said how much better it would have been if Arato had gone to their dealership instead. Meanwhile, Hide the Pain Harold grinned at the camera through his pain. He's now the face for a mental health campaign in Hungary. He's given TED Talks and become quite a celebrity. And the irony is that the real Hide the Pain Harold is not a miserable guy at all. I think I'm rather a happy guy, he says. But his face in that one photo tells a different story. They say a picture paints a thousand words, but that doesn't mean they're all true. There are photos of me that make me look happy, for example. There are probably photos of all of us that make us look different to how we really are. The fraction of a second that it takes for the camera shutter to open and to capture our image is no more than a flash of lightning and can be about as illuminating. The face in repose is what reveals the soul, someone once said. And that's why great paintings work. They capture something in a single image that it would take a hundred photos to match, and then not fully. As one of the first great advocates of physiogenic theory wrote, there are mystically in our faces certain characters that carry in them the motto of our souls, wherein he that cannot read ABC may read our natures. You should never perhaps judge a book by its cover, but you can still learn something by just looking, can't you? I'm in the fish and chip shop waiting with my children while our supper is cooked. It's Monday night, which is band night for the kids, which means I take them straight from school to the rehearsal and on our way back home at 6pm we pass the fish and chip shop. And well, it'd be foolish not to, wouldn't it? The kids are chatting happily about their day, telling me and the other customers all sorts of things espousing new theories of existence. But I think the weekend should be five days long and school should be only on Saturday and Sunday. Or ideas about the universe. When the sun burns out, I think it should have a sun so the earth can carry on. All the usual dotty, inventive, fascinating stuff. Ah, they're such fun at this age, aren't they? Says the man behind the counter as he piles up our chips. The grandchildren. Grandchildren? Grandchildren? It's not the first time I've been mistaken for my kid's grandfather. It was happening 10 years ago when I gave up work, as in paid to leave the house at 8am work, to look after them full time. I went along as their dad to the local mums and toddlers group, among all the very obviously young mums and the rather elderly and earnest helpers, and I was often mistaken for their granddad. I'm not offended. I know with a beard I probably look a few years older than I am, and I always have. I was always tall for my age, which had advantages, like getting served underage, no questions asked, in the pub or off licence, but also meant I was often refused a child's fare on the bus, even when I genuinely was one. A child, that is, not a bus. So anyway, I've got used to it, this being mistaken for somebody older. But your children's grandfather? Really? Do I look that old? 
I tell Lucy later bef uh, when we've had our chips and she laughs rather too readily, I feel, before deciding to try and reassure me. But I can tell just by looking in the mirror that it's true. I do look older than the average dad. I am older than the average dad because I'm not an average dad, at least statistically. The average age for fathers in the UK is 33 and I was over 40 when my son was born. I've done it all before, of course, when I was nearer the average age, and I have a daughter who could easily become a mother now, although she'd be doing so at a statistically early age if she did, because the average age for becoming a mother in the UK now is 28. She has just graduated and is about to start a career, and a family may happen for her in the future if she wants one, but I suspect it won't be for several years. Nevertheless, I could, technically, be a granddad and I clearly look like one. Like Harry though, I try to hide the pain. And just like Harry, I don't seem able to manage it very well. I sometimes notice family and friends do a momentary double take when they see me for the first time after a while. I get concerned looks. I get asked questions. I hate talking about it, so I give evasive answers to anyone who asks me how I'm feeling and if how I'm feeling needs explaining, I still say something else like I've got a bad back or a migraine. It's a lot simpler that way. People nod, make sympathetic noises and pull sympathetic faces. They don't actually say anything else, which is how I want it. They wince for me, mirror my pain, and I can see from what they're doing what my face is showing. It's a common response. Voltaire once said that the mirror is a worthless invention. The only way to truly see yourself is in the reflection of someone else's eyes. What I see reflected in people's eyes ranges from surprise, concern and interest to suspicion, boredom and irritation. My grimace might resemble Hide the Pain Harold, but the joke is on me, and it's adding years to my appearance. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Tim. So it's such a powerful piece, and I'm so glad you selected that one, because I think it resonates, it would resonate really with anyone living with pain. Um, and I think a lot of people um, here can relate to those questions. Um, thank you so much for sharing. That's, that's absolutely fine. I think it's summed up, um, it, 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 for me, it's the one passage that sums up what I was talking about earlier, that, that, um, that frustration and the negativity and the enormous hurdle that I personally had to, had to try and overcome in order to get to a situation that I'm in now because um, I'm in a far better place than I was then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reassure and, everybody. And that's, uh, but that's, I think that's the, that's the wonderful thing about your book is it's filled with hope as well. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons for reading this book. It's um, the relatability of what you go through. It's the, it's the whole thing about the personal being the universal. Um, and then, mm. The hope on the other side, I think, is incredibly is incredibly important. Um, but it's uh, honestly, for me, it's it's very much that uh, that um, you know the fact that you are an author um, and have written numerous books is it shines through in your writing. You know, it's Thank it's you. gosh, high it's, praise. It's, Thank it's, you very much. You no, know, it is. It's just it's really it's it's really beautifully written. Thank you. Thank um, you. Would it be um, uh, would it be appropriate to see if anyone's got any questions? Yeah. So I was just going to say I was just going to say what we might do here is we might stop the recording. Um,